The eldership here at Eastside Congregation were concerned about the things that's going on in the world, and so the eldership has put together a statement that we'd like to share with the rest of the congregation, and James will be sharing that with you. During these difficult days, we all have been subjected to disruptions in all aspects of our lives. Our daily routines, jobs, finances, school, health care, even church attendance. Everything seems to be out of sync. Many are beginning to feel the pressure that these changes are placing upon us. Our lives are unsettled and confused. Worry, anxiety, and fear are beginning to raise their heads. As unprecedented as this health crisis is, God's children have undergone severe threats far worse than this. The Old Testament is full of calamities that beset God's people. The destruction of the world except for Noah and his family. Bondage of the Hebrew nation in Egypt. The carrying away of Judah and Israel into exile. The persecution and execution of Christians in the New Testament. During these tragedies, God's prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles in the New Testament encourage the people to trust in God, their Creator. The prophets and apostles still speak to us today. Through His Word, God tells us to look to Him, to trust Him. He knows our plight. He knows what is happening. He knows what we need. Let all of us trust in Him, love Him, obey Him. Through prayer, let us petition Him for help and strength during these times. May each of us remember each other, reach out and check on each other, offer and provide help if needed. May we look and take advantage of the opportunities that will arise for us to serve our friends and neighbors. Crisis can tear apart and unravel societies and people. But we, as Christians, have hope in our God. We can and will come through stronger and closer to each other and to God. Our prayer is that all will place their trust and faith in God, serve each other, and stay safe. May God bless us all. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we come to the throne of grace at this point in time in our life to thank you for preservation of our life, to thank you, Father, for your word, the Bible, which directs us here upon this earth. 
We're so grateful and thankful for Jesus Christ, thy Son, who came to this earth to suffer, to bleed, and die on the cross to provide a way for us to be a part of thy family here upon the earth. And Father, we realize that at this time we are trying times, and we ask for your wisdom, your guidance, and your protection. Pray that you would be with the elders of this congregation as they strive to direct us in the path that they feel that is best for us at this time. Give them wisdom, Father, to do this. We ask you to bless the work of the church here and throughout the world. And we know that many, many people at this time are hurting because of the virus that's spreading through our country. We ask, Father, for thy protection. Keep us safe as and help us to trust in your word and in your will as we strive to do those things would bring glory and honor unto thee and thy kingdom. Thank you for this congregation of thy people. Father, we pray that you would bless the work of the church here. Bless us as we reach out to those who are lost around about us as we strive to teach thy will to their, and they might be obedient to that will that they too can be a part of the family of God. Ask thee, dear God, to guide, guard, and direct us and keep us safe. Now then, we, Father, are mindful of all those who are hurting, those who have lost loved ones in, in regard to this virus and other means. We pray that you would bless those families Help them to look to Thee for strength and for guidance. Those who have lost their jobs and who are out of work, we pray, Father, that somehow they can be taken care of and they can soon be back at work and providing for their family and their loved ones. As for Your will to be done and not ours. Father, help us to trust in Thee. We know these are hard times. We know that this has been the case throughout the history of the world, that there's always ups and downs. And pray with us. Pray that we'll be faithful to Thee in the down times and serve Thee to the very best of our ability as we look forward to that home that we can be with Thee in heaven one day. For it's in the name of Christ we pray this prayer. Amen.
So as we come together to um, take of the Lord's Supper, to help prepare our minds for reflection on the sacrifice that the Lord has made for us, for our salvation, I wanted to read Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 12. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 12. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he, he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, he was led as a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto his death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Let's give thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you to give thanks for the great sacrifice that you gave for us in allowing your Son to die on the cross for the remission of our sins. Lord, we can do nothing to earn that that sacrifice that you did for us and we know that without that we would be lost as we partake of this bread that represents your son's body we ask that you bless it and help it nourish our bodies and we ask all things in your name amen As we continue to give thanks and remember the sacrifice that was made for us, I'd like to read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13-22, through 22, so we can see as an example of how we should live our lives based on the sacrifice that Christ made for us. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13-22, through 22, And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you, you should suffer for righteous sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he may bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we come again to give thanks again for the sacrifice you made for us. We know that Christ suffered long and he didn't have to do that and it was completely voluntarily on his part according to your will and we are so ever grateful for that sacrifice that he made for us. As we partake of this cup that represents his blood, let us stay focused on what was done for us, Lord, and examine ourselves and ask that you be with us and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name, amen. Today's scripture reading is Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. We use sayings every day. And so much of our social media today is driven by sayings and mottos, slogans, memes, all kinds of things. Statements and platitudes are used to drive us. They're used to encourage us to, to make better choices, to stay positive, especially during difficult times, to, to help us stay focused in the right direction. There are a few sayings that we use pretty often that I think have some great spiritual significance, and I want to share a couple of those with you today. Number one, practice what you preach. We find this idea even when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, and when Paul recounts that, that it had been given to him, he says, I received of the Lord that which also I received and delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he, was, uh, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And in the same manner he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This idea of proclaiming is the same word to preach. The King James used the word to show as the idea that we're showing forth this until the Lord returns. We proclaim, we preach the Lord's return in partaking of the Lord's Supper. Well, how does that cause us to live? Because we're talking about practicing what we preach. So that should affect us in some way. When we think about partaking of the Lord's Supper and practicing what we preach, we're showing the, the Lord's death and, His, and, and proclaiming His return. And we're taught to practice righteousness. The Apostle John wrote this in 1 John chapter 2, verses 28-29. He says, Now, little children, abide in Him, that when He appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. John makes this connection with those who are born in Christ, born of Christ, that they practice, they live out that picture of what is right, of righteousness, that which has been set aside by His Word. We practice those things. And so, in other words, our words mean something, but our actions are sometimes even speaking louder. Our actions are stronger, in other words. John also wrote this, My little children, let us not love in word nor in tongue, but also in deed and in truth. And so, yes, we can say that we love someone and we can do those things, but it make, makes more sense and it's also more encouraging. And when we're living it out, then people actually know by our actions that we truly do love them. And so he says, not just in word, not just in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Those things are important. So this idea of practice what we preach, both is seen uh, even in partaking of the Lord's Supper when it's instituted by our Lord, but also even thinking about the Apostle John and his words to the early church. And he implores them, my little children, don't just say that you love one another, but show that in your words. 
And I think that principle is seen in our saying, significant saying of practice what you preach. Number two, we say this all the time, don't ever give up. Some of you have probably seen the little picture of uh, the, the bird who's uh, trying to swallow the frog and the frog's got his arms around the throat uh, as he's going down trying to stop the, the bird from swallowing him. That's the idea. That's the, the visual that we sometimes get and we laugh at that. But that's the idea. We want to encourage one another to never give up. You know, Jesus himself taught us to endure all things and said, he says, you'll be hated for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Matthew 10 verse 22. He talked about those who were persecuted and, and those who will persecute you in this city, he says, go to yet another one. He says, surely I say to you, you will not have gone through all the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. He says, persecution may come, difficulties may come, but never give up. Endure to the end that you might be saved, Matthew 10, 22 and 23. In the letters to the churches of Asia, the first part of the book of Revelation, Revelation 2, 8 through 10, we have this to the church at Smyrna. He says, These things says the first and last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews but are not, and rather they're the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. He was warning them of things that were about to come. He says, Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And he says, You'll have tribulation for this period. And he says, Ten days. But be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. How encouraging is that? And that warning that Jesus tells John to write these things to the church. And for that particular church, the things that they were about to suffer, they were already suffering some persecution. They were already going through those trials and tribulations. And he says, and I know that. I know your good works. I know the trials that you're going through. I know all of those things. I know that you feel that deep poverty, but in fact, you are rich. And he says, and I know those things that are going on around you. I know the blasphemy of those that are around you. He says, but through these things that you're going to suffer, he says, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Don't ever give up. In fact, the Hebrews writer uh, includes the same idea. He says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the sin which so easily besets us or ensnares us, and let us run with endurance or patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now that's found in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. But right on the very heels of chapter 11, where we find uh, those examples of the faithful, all the things that they went through. And you can go back through your Bible and you can study each one of those and, and their stories, what they were facing in life, the hardships, the temptations that they were facing, and the trials that they went through. And yet he says, we have this great cloud of witnesses, don't we? So he says, lay aside every weight and keep pushing forward. He says, you've, you've got to overcome and, and continue, endure, don't ever give up is the idea from the Hebrews writer as well. We must never give up. Number three, focus on the positive. You know, I think especially in today's time and the things that are probably going on around us, it's easy to get caught up in uh, the news cycle. It's easy to get caught up in, in the press conferences. It's easy to get caught up in, in, in all of the, the, the social media conversation that's out there about uh, the virus and, and things that are going on around us. But not only that, in the middle of all that, how do we cope? How is it that we deal with all of those things? And here's our phrase, focus on the positive. In other words, stay focused. We, we often will easily detract to what is the negative, and that's easily uh, going to catch our attention so often. But stay focused focused on what's positive. Stay focused on those good things. This is where I want you to join me if you have your Bibles. I want you to look with me in Philippians 
In this particular letter, Paul writes and he talks about joy over and over in this short letter that he writes sitting from uh, a prison cell practically. And what Paul reminds us is that we are to rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. How could he possibly be talking about this, that and encouraging us to be joyful when so many things are going wrong maybe around us? Well, it was his outlook on life that seemed to make the difference. In Philippians 1 and verse 21, he says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You see, from the very outset, Paul had that in mind. That, that kind of set the stage for where Paul was at in his mind. And all of those things that, that, that were going on around him, you know, either way, no matter what happened in life, if, if he's living, then he's living for Christ. If he's dying, then he says that's going to be gain because heaven would be uh, his home. That's the goal that he was pressing toward. But then in the next chapter, in chapter 2, he begins, he says, if there's any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels and mercies, he said, fulfill my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, being of one mind. And he says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. And so he's trying to get us to, to focus a certain way. And then he continues on. He says, look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. And then he tells us how that's going to happen. We need to have the mind of Christ. There in Philippians 2 and verse 5. Have this mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And wherefore God has also highly exalted him, given him a name which was above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." He says, we need to have this kind of mind. We need to be thinking this way, focusing on the right things, focusing on the good things. And so, what is that? We get into chapter 3, and after a few verses of reminding those brethren at Philippi of his own background and the things that he, he counted for loss, he then would say this. He says, not as though I had already attained... Either were already perfect. He knew that he wasn't perfect. He knew that he hadn't achieved that goal yet. But he says, I'm working toward that. And so he says, I count on my help, myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do. That might be another phrase that we, that we could talk about at another time. This one thing I do. When you focus on one thing, we sometimes tell our children, this one thing I want you to do, right? And so he says, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth or pressing forward to those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And he says, let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. In other words, think this way, that if in anything you should be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this even unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we, were already, we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. What a beautiful thought that Paul is including in that, that oneness of the body of Christ and that oneness that we're to experience together because we're focusing on the right things, focusing on that which is righteous, focusing also on the positive, trying to stay positive and continuing to move forward. So often it's the case in life that we're, we're reaching backwards. We're, we're thinking about things that are in our past, things, those things that are holding us back. We should learn from them, but keep moving forward and pressing toward that goal. And that goal ultimately is heaven. And that brings us then to chapter 4 of Philippians. Thinking still about focusing on the positive, he says in verse 4 again, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. And so then he says, The Lord is at hand. Be careful or be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace that surpasses all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, 
just, pure, lovely, and of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything that's praiseworthy, think or meditate on these things. And there again, there's our picture of focusing on the positive, thinking about those things which are good and right. There's much that could cause us to squirrel, so to speak, and cause us to, to lose focus, or it calls us ultimately then to lose heart if we're not careful. But if we focus on what is positive and we focus on those right things, that's certainly going to help us. And in that same chapter, uh, he says this, My God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So we have that that promise that if we focus on the right things and we continue down that right path, that ultimately God's going to supply all of our needs. So stay focused on the positive as well. And here's one last thought for us. Life is too short to wait. We sometimes use that phrase, life is too short. And many people throw that around with different ideas. But here's the thought, biblically speaking, life is too short to wait. James, the inspired writer, reminds us that life is but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes right away. Uh, It's like poof and it's gone, just like that. And so with that in mind, with that picture of what life is and how quick life truly is, there are some examples that are given in Scripture that remind us of the importance of, of making good decisions and making them now, not putting off those things that we need to do that are that important, especially when it comes to those spiritual things that we're talking about. We have a picture of those in Acts chapter 2 that are gathered there on the day of Pentecost. Jews, devout Jews out of every nation under heaven, and they hear the gospel preached on that day. And they it's almost as if they interrupted the sermon that was being preached. Well, men and brethren, what shall we do? They realize they've killed the Christ. They've realized that, that they've that they have slain the Christ and their only hope for salvation. But Peter and the apostles, they tell them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. With many other words did he exhort and testify, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation, this evil generation. In other words, he's saying, Don't put this off. This is what you need to do now. Repent and be baptized. Why? For the remission of sins. This was what they needed right then, and they didn't put it off. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's after they had gladly received His word and were baptized. And we find in verse 47 that they were, in fact, added to the church as being saved. And so Acts 2 gives us a, a clear picture of those who certainly understood life is too short to wait. And there's another example we find, really two of them in Acts chapter 16. We find Lydia and her household, Lydia and and those women who were down by the river. And the Apostle Paul comes in contact with them and begins to then teach them. They were were worshipers of God, and they were worshiping, and he taught them about Christ. And what we find is she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul, and they, her and her household, were all baptized. It's amazing. You look at that in Acts 16, verses 14 and 15. They didn't waste time. When they heard the gospel message, they responded to it. Later in Acts 16, we have the jailer. Paul and Silas had been arrested, and late at night, near midnight, they're singing praises unto God in the in the deep part of the prison there uh, where there's really no, no light, and they were singing praises unto God and praising Him. And what we find is that that same hour of the night, when after there had been uh, that earthquake and opened up the prison bars, and yet nobody has escaped, the jailer runs in and and realizing that uh, when he was about to take his life because he thought maybe everybody has escaped, that hasn't happened. Paul says, don't harm yourself. And he begins to teach him about Jesus. And the same hour, we know that he went and washed their stripes where they had been beaten earlier in the day, a show of a penitent heart. And we find, and he was baptized, he and all his, the Bible says, straightway, immediately in other words. He did this thing. He acted upon what he knew to be right and true. He didn't put that off. Life's too short to wait. 
We have another example of Agrippa, King Agrippa, who actually failed to realize this when Paul had preached to Agrippa and he says to Paul, you, you've almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Paul says, I, I wish that it was the case that, uh, that, that you would go on basically and obey the gospel, but he says, you've almost persuaded me. We have no record of Agrippa, King Agrippa, ever responding to the gospel uh, properly, but what we find out is that that idea of you've almost persuaded me almost may be too late. And so life is too short to wait. We need to think about those things seriously. And I hope this lesson would be one that would encourage us to, to think about some significant sayings that we use every day in our life, but they're significant because certainly they have a biblical principle that stands behind them that, that teaches each one of us what we need to be doing and how we need to be responding today. In this short lesson today, just wanted to remind us of things that are important in life, things that are spiritual, things that would help us to maintain our focus on what is right. And so it may be the case that you might need prayer. It may be the case that you have learned the gospel as well and need to, to find a way to respond. And I understand that we are uh, homebound essentially uh, currently because of this virus, but at the same time, you can respond. And we're going to give that information, how you can respond to us, reach out to us, and we will help you and we'll further study with you if that's what you desire. Any way that we might be able to help, and uh, please reach out to us and you'll have our information on the next slide that you see. And so if we can help, we want to do so. We want to encourage you and we want to help strengthen you in your spiritual walk with God. And so if we can help, let us know how. Our Father in heaven, you are an, an awesome God, a loving God, a good God. And Father, we know that you hear our prayers. And Father, just as David and Job and others cried out to you in times of trouble, we're crying out to you now, Father, because we are in some trouble. Father, we, uh, we ask that you help us with this trouble, with this virus that has taken over much of the world and is in our nation now and is spreading. And Father, we just ask that you, you stop it through whatever means you can at whatever time frame is consistent with your will. But Father, we ask that you um, stop the virus in its tracks as soon as, as possible. Father, we also today want to lift up to you those that have been affected by the virus. Many have lost their lives around the world and across the country. Others are infected and are under quarantine, and we want to just lift all of those up to you. 
We also want to lift up to you the doctors and the nurses and the caregivers and those that seem to be on the front line of the fight, Father, um, treating patients and um, doing so at much risk to themselves. Uh, we include Eddie among that number, Father, but there, we know there, there are many others across the, the country and across the world who are doing that. We also pray, Father, that you will be with those that are trying to develop a vaccine, that that can happen quickly. And for those that are involved in um, producing the ventilators and the mask and the other things that are required to treat patients, uh, we pray that that production can be ramped up and we can get the, the things that we need to the hospitals that need them as soon as possible. Father, in terms of our church family here at Eastside, we want to pray for our elders, for Gary and Andy and James. Father, as shepherds, they have a difficult job even when the flock is all together in one place. But it becomes even more difficult, Father, when the, the flock is scattered and we're not able to assemble. And so I pray, Father, that you will be with them and give them strength and give them guidance and um, just help us as members of the flock to, uh, to be helpful to them as they look after the rest of the flock. Help us to be a part of that, Father, and to, and to just encourage them in every way that we can. Father, we ask that you be with our preacher Wayne and his family and uh, their ministry here and in the next several weeks as that ministry evolves in terms of method, we pray that you'll give him guidance and insight on the best ways to do that. We ask that you be with our deacons, Greg and Eddie and Lee and Brooke and Kevin as their ministries are impacted by this Father and um, may take some different forms in the coming weeks and months that you will guide them in their efforts. Father, we want to lift up to you our shut-ins, Lance and Julia and Rick. And uh, we always uh, want to keep them in our, in our hearts, Father, and reach out to them and check on them, as well as our, our many elderly members, Father, who are um, at especially high risk for this virus. Father, we ask that you be with our widows, with Anna and Edwina uh, Eckstein, with Faye Gooch, with Joyce and Edith and Johnny Tittle, uh, these widows, Father, are oftentimes alone, and in, in these difficult times, it can be a very scary thing just to be in a, a house alone, Father, and so we pray that uh, you'll be with them and strengthen them, Father, and encourage them and um, help us to continue to reach out to them. We also know, Father, that there are some among our number who are suffering uh, job impacts or as, as a result of this virus. I know uh, Jason Johnson's hours have been cut back. Others have had their hours cut back or are at risk of losing their jobs, Father. And so uh, we, we just pray that you'll be with them and help those, those situations to resolve quickly and, and help the, the Christians that are around them to be able to, uh, to reach out and provide help as they're able, just as we saw happen in the, uh, the early church of the first century. Father, we ask that you be with those recovering from surgery with Julie and Brian and Becky and uh, we know that their ability to, to have follow-up appointments and that kind of thing may be impacted um, by the virus. And so we just pray that you'll give them good healing. And uh, we also want to lift up to you, TJ and Michelle, and their family as they prepare to move. Uh, it's always difficult to move, and we know that with all that's going on now, it will become even more difficult. But we, uh, we thank you for that family and for their <clears throat> service to this congregation and to your kingdom. And <clears throat> And we ask that you be with uh, TJ as he uh, begins a new ministry at their new congregation, that you'll um, just bless him and his efforts there. And Father, we just pray that through this uh, situation, these tough times, that we will uh, draw closer to you. We know, Father, that you're in charge, um, that the entire universe is in the palm of your hand. And, and so we pray, Father, that we will look to you for guidance, that we will trust you, and that we will uh, always draw closer to you, um, all times, Father, but especially in these tough times. I also pray, Father, that you'll help us to draw closer to one another. Father, we don't need a building to be a family or to worship at this time. Uh, we are the church, Father, and we will continue to worship you wherever and whenever and however we can. 
And so, Father, we ask that even as we're oftentimes physically apart now for the next several weeks, that we can still be be together as a church family and that we can still continue to worship you. And I also pray, Father, as families, we're able to draw together and and become closer and perhaps uh, families that have not been able to spend as much time together because of work uh, commitments and school commitments, um, that we can use this time, Father, to to become closer as a family, a physical family, and uh, and perhaps begin doing devotionals or prayer sessions or whatever we can do as a family just to encourage one another and become closer. And Father, I also pray at this time that you can help us to reach out to our neighbors. Uh, many of them are suffering. Um, that could get worse in the days ahead, Father. We may have neighbors that need our help, that need a, a grocery run or need us to do something to, uh, to make their lives a little bit easier and to relieve uh, suffering and to provide hope, Father. And so help us to look for those opportunities. And we always pray, Father, through those opportunities that there may be a chance to share uh, the gospel message to them. Father, as I close this prayer, I just want to thank you for, for Jesus, for his life and his death and, and his example for us. Father, we know that because of Jesus and because of his sacrifice on the cross that we have a hope for salvation. And we don't know exactly when our stories will end, Father, but we know that our stories end well when we're in Christ. And so help us to remain in Christ, help us to remain strong, and help us to look out for one another. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.